Thank you very much. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, so I'm primarily going to talk about vitamin D. And this cartoon is appropriate because eggs have some vitamin D in them, uh, but also because there's a lot of controversy about vitamin D in terms of its real significance. So it's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation. So that's why I've chosen that. So we all know, everyone agrees, that shortage of vitamin D is associated with poor bone health. Typically, uh, in my father's time, rickets. And it's making a resurgence. And this is from a Bradford uh, newspaper quite recently. Because there's been a dramatic incidence, increased incidence of rickets uh, in, in Britain generally. Uh, in Bradford, it's primarily in the Asian population who have a darker skin. And that happens because when your skin is darker, then the wavelength of light that penetrates it uh, is less, and actually we get most of our vitamin D from the sun. And if you live in Bradford and you're darker skinned, it's quite difficult to make vitamin D. So everyone agrees that vitamin D is associated with rickets, and it's been a problem for man for a very long time. So on the left, there is um, a photograph of one of the Medici children who died before the age of five in Florence in the Middle Ages, and that skull is abnormally shaped because of rickets, shortage of vitamin D, and on the right, you see this is the oldest skeleton found, a Neolithic skeleton with rickets. And why is it such a problem, shortage of vitamin D? It's a problem because there is very little vitamin D in the, in the diet normally. There's a little bit in eggs, there's a little bit in mushrooms. Uh, it's mainly fatty fish. Um, but unless you've got a passion for mackerel and you have it every lunchtime, it's quite difficult in Britain to get sufficient uh, vitamin D from your diet. Uh, in America, you get a bit more because many more foods are fortified. They have vitamin D added. In fact, we get most of it from, from the sun. Uh, it's synthesized. The sun shines on your skin and you synthesize vitamin D from a cholesterol precursor in the skin. Now, it's the same wavelength of light that allows you to make vitamin D that causes sunburn. So that's an important thing uh, to remember. So this is from the British Dietetics Association in Britain, and essentially it says that we get, uh, what I've just said really, uh, that, it, that we get our vitamin D uh, essentially from, from the sun. Over the years, very many patients have said to me, but I have a very healthy diet, I have lots of fruit and vegetables, and the point is actually that, that it, it, it's not that that causes the problem, it's, it's, um, it's short of, shortness of fatty fish. Uh, and this is uh, a study that was published uh, from Hippenen et al. And what they did was they took vitamin D levels in lots of uh, patients, lots of individuals who've been followed up from birth as part of a study. And uh, on the top, you can see uh, a map of hours of sunshine uh, in different parts of the country. So the more orangey-brown it is, the more hours of sunshine we get. And what we can see is that in the north, of course, we don't get very much sunshine, in case you haven't noticed, those of you who live in the north. Uh, and in Scotland, you get less still. And on the bottom is a map that shows the frequency of vitamin D insufficiency up and down the United, well, of England, uh, England and Scotland and Wales. And what we can see there is that the darker shades are associated with increasing proportions of the population who are short of vitamin D. And what you can see is that in Scotland, a very high proportion of the population are significantly short of vitamin D all year round. Uh, and actually that in much of the country, a very considerable proportion are short of vitamin D in the spring. Uh, and this is uh, a picture of the range of skin colours that we see uh, um, in most countries. And uh, in the north, this is particularly a problem in, in Scotland for darker skinned people. But in some ways, it's also a problem for the fair skinned. 
Uh, now here I would disagree with the, the list, the way they they've orientated these these young people because the tall young woman there, the redhead, third along, is is it implies she's not the fairest, but I would say she's the fairest. She's going to burn most easily. Tends to have the fairest skin, and we're discussing that because fair skin is associated with a risk of an increased risk of melanoma, a modest one but a significant one. And by fair skin, I mean skin that tends to burn. And actually, that expl- that's seen in a lot of British, British people. And they tend to keep out of the sun. And so actually, um, in Britain, within this range of skin colours, we have problems at an extreme. We have problems in the darker skin individuals who get even less vitamin D from their sun, and we get problems in redheads, because actually they can't go out in the sun very much without burning. So it's it's a complicated thing, uh, but essentially the bottom line is that most people in Britain tend to be short of vitamin D in the spring, and that's especially true at the extremes of skin colour. And this is from a study that we reported um, in the literature in 2011, and this is uh, from the from the paper. And what you can see in these tables in the middle column is if there's a negative, um, a minus sign in front of it, it means that factor is associated with lower vitamin D levels, and if there's a plus, it's associated with higher vitamin D levels. And so you can see sun sensitivity is associated with lower levels. Again, I suppose it's because of that thing. You can't go out there for long enough without burning and therefore you tend to run at a lower level. Um, there's a genetic effect. Uh, so our genes explain a lot of health issues. Right at the bottom we see that people have lower levels if, they've got, if they're overweight, if they have a higher body mass index. But of very great relevance to melanoma patients and their families are the, are the two, three higher than that. Supplements were the strongest predictors of higher vitamin D levels, uh, and hot holidays and sun exposure were also associated with higher vit- vitamin D levels. Not surprising, but if melanoma patients and their families are, av- are advised to avoid sunny holidays, then they're going to, one would suppose, uh, have a resultant lower level of vitamin D. I lost you all by now. I hope not. Uh, and this is a, um, a graph from the paper, which I hope illustrates this. These, these are people who are not taking supplements in the north of England. And uh, these across the bottom are the hours outside at weekends in the summer. And the red line is people who are sun sensitive, and the green line is people who are not. And most laboratories say we should have a level at about 60 nanomoles per litre, which is that dotted horizontal line. And what that shows is that even people here, um, even people who are out all day on Saturdays and Sundays, six hours all day on Saturdays and Sundays, on average, they still had a level that was lower than 60 nanomoles per litre unless they were taking supplements. Um, so essentially what this, these data suggest is that what some people say about you just have to go out half an hour at lunchtime with your arms bared is sufficient to make vitamin D. I would argue that this, these data suggest that that is not so, particularly in the north of England. Now why does it matter for us here? And um, what um, the Dietetics Association say is that it matters for everybody because we uh, low levels are common in Britain, um, but it matters particularly for melanoma patients and their families because they tend to be fair-skinned, and what I've said is that they're at risk of lower vitamin D levels. And if uh, melanoma patients protect their skin from the sun on holiday in the future to reduce their risk of having another one, then they're more likely to become vitamin D deficient. And in my experience in my clinic, then melanoma patients are really careful with their children, and therefore would we then produce vitamin D insufficiency in their children. Um, Now, why do we care? We care particularly also because we published information in the literature a few years ago which suggested that it might matter for vitamin D uh, for melanoma patients. And uh, this is from that paper. And what this shows, on the right, that's the average level of vitamin D level. And on the left, that's 
the Breslow thickness, the thickness of your melanoma. And what you can see is that the thicker the melanoma, then the lower the vitamin D level on the right. So that suggests that vitamin D levels are associated with growth of your, your melanoma, thickness of your melanoma. And when we looked at the survival curves, then we saw that people who had the lowest uh, third in vitamin D levels, that's the blue line, did less well than those who had higher levels. So the possibility was that vitamin D might play a helpful protective role in melanoma. And so if we were then saying to patients to stay out of the sun after diagnosis, could we be making things worse for them by lowering the level of vitamin D? Uh, actually, this is a, a study from a German center more recently that showed very similar findings to ours, but there they related vitamin D levels to stage at diagnosis. Now, it isn't so simple as that. If you look in the literature, you can find graphs that show a relationship with vitamin D and almost everything. It can't all be right. This is a paper that shows a relationship with, uh, between vitamin D level and risk of breast cancer. Is that right? Is vitamin D something to do with breast cancer? Um, essentially, it's very controversial. And the problem that we have is this, that if you look at vitamin D levels in people, vitamin D levels are higher in leaner, fitter, healthier, wealthier people than they are in overweight, less generally fit people. And the criticisms of work uh, ascribing a causal relationship to vitamin D are as follows, that, that maybe the, the relationship we're seeing across the bottom between X and Y, vitamin D and melanoma survival, isn't a real one. It's not necessarily the vitamin D that it's doing. It is it that it's you, factor you, the fact that people with higher levels are generally healthier anyway. So we've seen a relationship, but we don't really know what the significance of it is. That was in 2019. And the, the other problem that we have concerns, and this is from The Guardian last year, is that a lot of people, medical people, worry about supplements in, in cancer patients. And that's because of studies that have shown a relationship actually between vitamin ingestion and a worse outcome for lung cancer patients. So what we've been doing ab about vitamin D is controversial, it's difficult, but we're, tr we're trying to sort it out. And uh, essentially, since 2009, my laboratory have been trying to understand it and trying to say, is this a real relationship? Should we be supplementing vitamin D or should we be not? And um, essentially, I believe that we do have now, we have now strong evidence that there is a real relationship with vitamin D, and that paper is just, just uh, going to be um, submitted for publication shortly. But at the time of the NICE guideline, for example, um, we didn't have these, this evidence published. We don't know what happens if you do supplement, but we certainly don't want to make things worse by telling patients and their families to avoid sunbathing, sunny holidays, without considering the need to balance the vitamin D. Um, so, um, what advice should we give to melanoma patients and their families uh, in, in the meantime? Well, I think it's important to advise them to avoid sunburn because we think that's causal for melanoma, but we don't want them to become vitamin D depleted uh, in so doing. And so um, the NICE guideline gives, gives a comment on that, which I'll mention in a moment. In the meantime, a national body called the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, SACN, which is related but not the same as NICE, published a draft report last year. And um, this is from a newspaper recording, reporting that draft report. And actually the draft report said that the weather is such, as you can see in the, in the Peak District there on a summer walk, the weather is such in the United Kingdom that we should all consider taking a modest dose of vitamin D, 400 international units of vitamin D3 per day, just indeed as my parents were given when they were children uh, in the 19, 1930s and 40s. Um, that's the advice for the general public. What the NICE guideline says is that newly diagnosed melanoma patients should have their vitamin D levels measured 
If they are already fine, then uh, supplementing them further is probably inadvisable because we don't know what that's going to do, but we don't want them to be deficient. Uh, and that's, that's essentially the, the policy that we follow now. So many patients want to take control of their health after a diagnosis. They want to do the right thing. I think many patients supplement uh, with vitamin or selenium or all sorts of additives. Um, there are no data that I am aware of that suggests that any supplementation uh, at all is beneficial for, for, for cancer patients and melanoma patients in specific, specifically. And I would therefore, I have always said to my patients that a balanced diet is what you need, a good healthy diet. Uh, and I have not therefore recommended supplements. The only exception is vitamin D because we don't want to make it worse by sun avoidance and therefore uh, in, um, in Leeds we have measured vitamin D levels and advised supplement, supplements if those levels are low and that's consistent uh, with the NICE guideline and indeed now consistent with the SACN guidelines. Uh, there is information for this on our website, the Genetics of Melanoma website, Genomel. And um, with respect to my talk this morning, there's also the option grids are on that web, web, uh, website. There's also a blog uh, about um, uh, of me talking about more about vitamin D, and there's an information leaflet for patients and their families about vitamin D. This is my research group and the clinical group in Leeds. Thank you.